Welcome to the Clear to Close podcast with your host, local mortgage expert, Ryan Bolton. Ryan has the questions and answers, tips and tricks, do's and don'ts, and expert guests to explain all the steps needed to buy or sell real estate. And now it's time for the Clear to Close podcast. Hey everyone, Ryan Bolton here. I am a mortgage nerd and I have a special guest with me today. I've got Colton Hill with 360 Home Inspections. And I tell you what, if you don't get a home inspection when you purchase a house, you are opening yourself up to all kinds of different problems. So I highly, highly recommend you get a home inspection because it is a big investment. It's a it's a property. There's so many little things that go wrong and there's an importance to know what you're buying, you know, what, what you're getting into and get everything tested because his job is to find something wrong with the house. And I guarantee he's going to find something. Now, whether it's a deal killer or not, that's up to what you happen to find. But it is something where I, I find so many people don't want to spend that money or just think the appraisal is good enough. And even sometimes the real estate agents don't want a home inspection because they don't want their deal to get kind of blown up. Yep. But it's amazing how often I find that you can save money or get eyes wide open. An amazing amount of the reports aren't deal killers. They're just, hey, now you know you need to fix X, Y, and Z. Right. So I wanted to bring Colton on to explain kind of how a home inspection works, what's the most common things you find. So maybe tell everybody about yourself, how long you've been doing home inspections, things like that. Yeah, so my name is Colton Hill. Uh, I'm the owner of uh, 360 Home Inspections. Um, I've been doing home inspections since uh, February of 2013. Hmm. Um, so I've, I'm just about to hit 6,000 inspections. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Over, okay. the, <laughs> over that time frame. So it's, it's been kind of crazy, but it's, you learn a lot the more you see. Um, and what kind of licensing does it take to be a home inspector? Like what, what certain things? Because I see some people that are just handymans that, that can do a home inspection, but an actual certified home inspection. Yep. So the the most common in in the U.S. is the, is called InterNACHI. It's a National Association of Certified Home Inspectors, um, and that's what I have. I'm a certified master inspector with them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of the crazy thing about Utah is there's actually only 12 states where you don't need that requirement. Um, you could just start your own company and be a home inspector tomorrow with just a simple business license and not even have that uh, specific certification to be a home inspector. And Utah is one of those states, huh? Yep. So we're oh, one of those 12 states okay. where um, I've worked with uh, just other companies and inspection companies in the past, and we're actually working together to try to get that passed so that it is a requirement because mm. um, I just think it benefits everyone to have everybody fully certified to do that type of work because sure. it is such important work. So what does it take to get, is there a certain amount of inspections, apprenticeship? Is there certain things you have to do to get that designation? Yeah, so there's a certain amount of uh, courses that you have to pass just to get started on that. Um, and then you'll get an apprentice, basically uh, license, so to speak. And then you have to do up to 150 inspections to get the next level um, of, of that certification. And then um, once you get above like the 2,500 uh, inspections um, without having any, you know, uh, insurance claims, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, then you end up getting that that master uh, Ooh, certification. So. Fancy, yeah. So you're a master, sense. huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. That's, so that's what over that's six thousand inspections. So. Okay. Well, so I'm at I'm just about to six thousand. Okay. Um, to get to the 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 master or the or the higher level that they claim, it, they say two thousand. Okay. Um, without any you know major uh, issues as far as insurance or, or lawsuits stuff like that. Oh, interesting. So, okay, yeah. that's I, I I'm surprised there isn't more of a standard that. You have to have to be licensed. I, I maybe I assume there was. I was surprised there isn't for Utah. So that's surprising. Yeah. I, we're we're trying to change that just because I think it's gonna it's gonna better the the whole process sure. as a whole. Sure. So. I think there's always an accountability that factors into that. So so uh, how long have you been in actually St. George? How long have you lived in St. George? So I moved down here in 2017. Okay. Um, so I've been doing it full time down in. Uh, so most of your inspections are Southern Utah. Correct. Okay. Yep. So uh, okay. mainly Iron in Washington County. Okay. Um, but I I mean I'll go as far as. You know, Fillmore, Scipio. Um, we've been out to Escalante. Have we done anything like Mesquite or Nevada, or is that a different license? No, for that so state? it's a different license. Okay. Um, so I haven't, I haven't yet kind of dove into that. It's just kind of been staying, staying right here, staying in Utah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, with all that experience and all those that many uh, in, inspections, what what are kind of the most common ones that you find? That maybe not the ticky tacky things like a tile. It seems like every single roof has a broken tile. Yep. yep. <laughs> in fact, I, I, so many of the reports I see. It's like it's got to be just boilerplated on your guys's report that the pest control barrier is gone and a broken tile. Right. Is that just like on every single report? <laughs> yeah, these tile roofs, especially because um, I mean they're going to last a lot longer than your shingles will. Mm -hmm. um, but they're 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 known to slide loose or to get some cracks through them. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, they should probably be rechecked every couple of years because um, like even when I get up to like hang my Christmas lights every year, I'll notice a couple on my house. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're just kind of, they, they're a little more maintenance than the shingles would be, but that's, it's just common. So most nine out of 10 houses are going to have 10, 15, maybe even 20 
really? the tiles that we want to get up and just kind of touch up. And plus the, the little boots, the little... Yeah, the vent know, pipes. Yeah, the vent pipe boots are just because of the temperature variances yep. and they're rubber or they just don't last very long in the heat up there on the top of the roof. Yeah. And those they seem just, like those go out pretty fast. Yep. Just kind of resealing those every, you know, three to five years typically is what's needed on those. And they'll just get those little gaps around it. Mm. And then you'll see when you get up into the attic, you'll see the staining coming down the vent pipes. Mm. Um, and that's where we can get a little bit of water that can damage the insulation, or if it gets really bad, it can end up into the drywall. Okay. Yep. So uh, on a standard home inspection, how much time would you spend on walking through the house? Like how many how many hours or how much time do you go through that house? And obviously it's based on the size of the home, yep. so that's going to vary. But what would you say is a general idea how much time you spend? So my general windows that I'll book is a two-hour time slot. Um, and that that will get me anywhere. It depends on your, your built-in square footage. Um, but let's say it's anything 2,500 square feet or less. I can usually get through... Uh, the first hour and a half is going to be me at the home doing the inspection. And then I'll typically take that last half hour to meet with the client, walk them back through everything, um, show them the big concerns, uh, answer any questions they have, show them where different shutoffs are with water, electric, gas. Um, so that last half hour is just kind of giving them a general summary so that when they get, it, get that report later that day, they kind of know the big ticket items that are already going to be on there. Yeah, I'm amazed at how thorough these reports are, how many pages they typically are. And most of the time they don't go through all, they just say, hey, what's wrong? You know, give me that right. summary on the front page this, within the first couple of pages. What are some of the biggest issues? So in Southern Utah, what do you see as kind of the the one that you really like to check? Like every time you know, okay, I know this could be an issue because of soils or, or mold or anything, uh, those types of things. What is kind of a very common thing that people should look for in St. George besides the, the tile the roofs tiles and stuff like that? that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of that is, um, a lot of the walkthroughs just going to be educational based, kind of showing them different items. Um, but some of the main concerns and problems that come up, or at least that I've gotten calls back on where people are, seem to be most concerned, um, for example, like if it's an older AC or furnace, um, we, we just want to find out, is it on a regular service schedule? Is it scheduled? Is it done every year? Um, and, and if it's not, um, just kind of like someone looking to, to possibly list their house as well. Um, it's always good to have those records to show hmm. that things have been serviced recently. So that's one one big thing that can come up on a lot of the houses that we could avoid if we just make sure that things are regular getting serviced. Um, some of the other things like with the water heater, for example, um, depending on the appraisal or the type of financing that we're getting, um, like the expansion tanks, the earthquake hmm. straps, okay. um, yep. a lot of easy stuff that just kind of causes hiccups getting through the process. Right, um, And those are some of the, the main common things that we'll look and, and try to find. And if there's any water damage, like staining around walls, stuff like that, even if it's not currently leaking, because I'll check to see if it is, um, it just tends to make people more nervous. So right, a lot of those right. things are just kind of hiccups that we can get ahead of. And so many times you can find out if the previous owner knew there was flood damage and they Correct. repaired it, but didn't, and it just is, that's why it's still stained. So the, the like I said, the the boot on the roof, they found it was leaking, so they fixed that, but there was still some staining or something in the attic for where yeah. it went down the truss or whatever, the, the, that type of thing. Yep. Um, and so is there anything that did – when did the earthquake straps? I know earthquake straps and that expansion tank, because some older homes don't have that. Correct. So a lot of times that is a recommendation. In some cases with the loan, they actually are required to put that that in there because the code has changed. Correct. You remember roughly when that kind of kicked in because it's like about – I'd say about half of the ones I'm seeing are ones that that is some that has become a concern. Yeah, and I don't know the exact year on it because code typically is going to change every three to four years. Okay, um, I've noticed a lot of them. Like so let's I don't know, roughly 2005 and older. Okay, almost none of them have those on there. So okay. I'm guessing okay. it's probably going to be some point after that. Okay, um, where that kind of has started. And I'll tell clients too. Like for example, if we do get into a house and it's a 2002 water heater, um, it's still going to go in the report that we recommend having those things installed. Mm -hmm. um, but I, if it were me personally, I'm not going to go put it on a 2002 water heater right. when it might go out in a, three weeks. Right, right, right. Um, so I just kind of, I, I try to word it like that in the walkthroughs to let them know, like, when you get the new one, um, obviously the plumber should already know to do that, but let's just make sure that when we get that next one put in, it's done the correct right. way. Uh, and earthquake straps are usually pretty simple. That's right. something where it's just the strapping it or having some sort of yep. handyman can do that. Even It's a not a hard kit to at least add that part right. of it. But the expansion tank is definitely a little bit more. A little bit more. A little bit more. Plumber-ish, you know, they're going to have to get some mm -hmm. uh, fittings and be able to make Solder sure that that's in. on there. And, yep. and it's something where I see a lot of times where they recommend that those things are replaced because they're at the end of the life. And I get a lot of addendums that do show that, hey, um, we got to replace this. But that's right. where a home warranty might be able to kick in too, Correct. which is, I think is that's where the compromise from the seller is like, I don't want to replace it when it's not broken. It it's at the end of its life, yep. but it's not broke yet. 
So why not wait until it actually breaks? And that's where right. I think the home inspection can help a lot with that. But so many times a home inspection can reopen the negotiation with the sellers to either say, hey, go fix X, Y, and Z or yeah. reduce the price. Or yeah. if it's a big deal killer, obviously you, you back out and you get your earnest money. You're not taking on somebody else's problem. Right. Um, so I think it's well worth the cost of an appra- uh, of a home inspection because usually you can work in at least enough repairs or just know the house is really good. How many times do you do home inspections on brand new homes? Because I see a lot of people avoid it on the brand new home, and I'm like, that's the one I'd want to do it on just as much, if not more. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm actually starting to do them quite a bit more in the last couple of years. Okay. Um, before that, I was doing hardly any of them. Really? But it has kind of started to turn into a more common thing um, that even the realtors that are representing them are, are recommended to have done. Um, and, it, and it also kind of going back to the certification part, um, by doing these new construction and working with some of these builders, um, they'll, they'll require me to turn in uh, my licensing, my E&O mm-hmm. insurance, all that information, um, which is a good thing as well, just to make sure that everybody's covered on that. Um, but yeah, I'm doing quite a bit of those. And even with the brand new homes, you're still going to have a checklist of 10 or 15 things that um, the, the buyer that's going to move into that house probably didn't notice because they're looking at you know, how the drawers are finished or like right, paint, right, right. chips, and stuff like that, instead right. of kind of the <laughs> behind the scenes type stuff. I remember I went through a house, this guy, you know, had the little blue tape for all the fixes. Mm -hmm. I've never seen so much blue tape in my life, and it was just all paint. I mean, just weird little... Two rolls of tape. Oh, I couldn't (laughs) believe... I think he had, had like, two colors, because he ran out of the blue and went with (laughs) green, you know, the frog tape or whatever, and I was blown away, but none of it was the mechanical things. It wasn't anything that you could see, like the dishwasher hooked up right. right. Like, I had one where they just didn't pull the plug off the dishwasher so it wasn't draining. Right. I mean, that's an easy, but you would have caught that in a home inspection. Right. And a lot of times a builder, especially with new homes, they've got warranties, they got things, they got their crews working on their subdivision. They'll go out and fix all those things. Yep. But it's just nice to know before you move in, you've got an inspection, everything's kind of working, everything's turned on. And there's so many times there's little things like that. A plug isn't hooked up right mm-hmm. or a switch is wrong or a GFI is not working or there's so many things like that that you won't know until you start living in the house, and then it's right. more of a hassle to try to... To get the subcontractors back out to yeah. get those repaired. Absolutely. If we can get that checklist before they find the signal dots and stuff, then... You well, yeah, when the builder gets time. their money, they're usually moving on to the next thing. They'll get to it. They yeah. usually are pretty good at that, but it's not going to be a first priority where right. if you got that bag of money on that sales price sitting there and say, hey, I need that dishwasher to work. I need the oven to be hooked up right. I need the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, you, it's a lot easier to get that punch list done that week. It now, is. there's still stuff. I had a, uh, a good friend of mine had a door that he'd ordered. The wrong one came in, so they kind of put up a temporary door. It took forever for him to put this kind of a custom-sized door, and it just took forever. Yeah. Even when the builder had it in his warehouse, it was still like forever. So there's, there's still going to be stuff on new construction, but yeah. there's so many little tiny things on a new home that a home inspection can really help you on. Yeah, and we like. I found one a uh, couple months ago. It was kind of interesting. The, it was a two-level house, and uh, they'd plumb the whole, all the toilets with the hot water. Oh, really? So it's like 120 <laughs> degree water in the toilet. The bidet on that would suck. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Good luck fixing that one. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a, that's an interesting one. And, I, you know, it's funny. Like some houses where you, where you flush or use the, you know, they, it goes cold and other times it goes hotter. So it's mm-hmm. kind of funny how that's an interesting yeah. thing to test. And you wouldn't test it until you're actually starting to use it or right. that type of thing. So that's why I think home inspections, I'm amazed there's any pushback at all. It seems like it's one of the smartest investments to make on an existing home or a new home yep. to just make sure everything's working, everything's checked out. Now, stuff still might get missed right. as you start using it or as you start functioning the home and it starts kind of breathing, you know, as, mm-hmm. as, as you're in it, moving around, shutting doors, opening doors. But there's so many times you guys catch stuff that's so easily fixable right. if you just knew about it ahead of time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's why I like with the report that, that I personally do, we color code everything in blue, orange, or red items. Um, and, and for example, with like a, a home that's uh, 20 years old, um, and I'll let the clients know when they get to the walkthrough, the majority of that report's going to be blue. Um, that's recommended maintenance, routine, you know, minor issues, stuff like that. And, and if, if, they don't, if they don't feel comfortable when they get that report back, we can go to five more of those houses and we'll probably have a lot of the same similar mm. blue items. Mm. Um, so let's focus on the bigger ticket items, the reds or, or the oranges and stuff like that. So what is your most common, like, deal-killing kind of thing? I mean, in, in southern Utah, is it the foundations? Is it more flood damage? I mean, kind of, what, do you, what do you find that when you go, man, this is a big, like, right when you get there kind of thing, it's okay, you got to fix this before you buy this house? Um, or is it mostly just maintenance stuff? If there's active leaks and stuff like that in plumbing, um, or like the, like the gray polybutylene piping, hmm. oh, um, yeah, 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 those, yeah. Are, those okay. can be some of the big ones that really scare people. Um, is any type of water is, is a big one for us. Okay. Um, Kind of like we mentioned earlier, if the, the um, air conditioner, furnace, water heater are older, 
but they're still working. That's kind of where we we back we talk them back in and make sure we're getting a home warranty. Because um, like we said, we can go three weeks, we can go three more years. Um, if you get to the the tail end where that warranty is about to expire, um, you know, renew it possibly because it might That's, be cheaper. I've renewed to do that. mine for the last couple of years because right. I had an air conditioner when I was like six grand. They right. covered that, and I figure, well, even if I have to pay that yearly for everything else, right. I'm still way ahead on mm-hmm. that one repair. And I think it's I think they're really well worth it. They've gone up the cost of it. The service fees have gone up as, right. as everything else has gone up. But I still think it's way better than not having that warranty. And for a seller too, it makes sense. Hey, here's this will cover everything that's just older on the end of its life or whatever that's happened there. Yeah. And so sometimes if, if they are older units, some people will walk anyway, just be based on that. Right. Oh yeah. Um, but we we try to educate them on that and just make sure that hey, here's a, a solution, here's a here's an option that would be helpful. And that generally will kind of help that process go over and make them Feel more comfortable knowing that they'll have some some coverage if that does go out. Um, and on like a, a normal air conditioner, what is kind of a life expectancy? When do you get to the point where it is a recommendation on your? I mean, I'm sure you have some sort of standard that if it gets after what ten years, is there certain kind of windows, or is it based on the model, the size of it? Kind of how do you determine when it's at the end? Of yeah, its life? so the size of the unit based on the square footage of the house is going to be a big thing because mm-hmm. that's depending on how hard it's actually working. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a second home, if it's a home that has you know ten people in it, all, all that stuff's going to affect the usage. Um, but generally, what we're seeing is anywhere from about 12 to 15 years hmm. um, on the AC units. Um, the furnace is down here, obviously, typically going to last longer because they're not getting used as much as the, the cooling unit. Right. Okay. Um, so that's generally about what we're seeing. The same with uh, water heaters. Is that kind of a similar thing, or is those a little bit longer? They're actually, they seem to be a little bit less. And again, that depends, like, if you have two 50-gallon tanks versus one 50-gallon and, and how many people are in there, that type of thing. Okay. Um, usually about 8 to 12 years is what I've noticed on an average. I mean, I did one... Last week, that was like from 1991, which was oh, wow. pretty crazy and wow. it was still working well. <laughs> oh, wow. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, generally about eight to 12 years is, is kind of what we're seeing with the water heaters. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So is that it, it, is it water heaters that are more the problem or is it air conditioners? What do you, I mean, it seems like it's it, it can vary. I don't know if there's even an answer no, to some of that. No, not but. <laughs> really. I mean, it's just kind of, yeah. I mean, really the only thing I've noticed is that the, like I'll get a an original furnace and then the AC might be replaced like six years ago the furnaces just seem to last a little longer just because i think just because the, the the climate down here right they just don't them. have to get used mm-hmm. quite as often but i don't think they get serviced probably quite as often either because no, they just don't get don't. used and they just sit there for for yeah. so much longer before they fire they finally get fired up yeah we did a funny thing where we're, uh my previous in- inspection company and the guys that i still talk to all the time that work for them um, we always send pictures of the dirtiest furnace filters we can find. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll do a, a gift card at the end of the year for like a little trip to Vegas. Whoever got the dirtiest one, just something fun just to kind of <laughs> see. But you'd be surprised how how dirty some of them would get. And people just don't keep up on, on getting and That's those one of the easiest maintenance things. So it's talk important. about that. You you go to Home Depot and you see 50 different filters and all of them have pets. And, and I've heard some people say don't get the ones that have a lot of restriction that catch a lot of the allergens and stuff. Use right. the cheaper ones. And I've I had other people say, no, you at least want to go. What would you? What is the best recommendation as far as how often? I mean, obviously going to differ with pets and stuff mm-hmm. like that that have more of the pollutants or more of the hair getting up in there. But which, which filter really should people be using? Because they're all over the place. Yeah, so I did a, a CE class with a, an HVAC company that was kind of sponsoring that and kind of going over some of that stuff. Not and the filter company, the HVAC company. Not the company. filter company, the, <laughs> no, the HVAC company. The yeah, good, that's a good question. Good question. So, um, and they always just recommended their clients just get the get the cheap ones hmm. and replace some seasonally. So, like um, when you go from spring to summer, summer to fall, so four times a year, okay. and then just just keep up on that. And then obviously, if you have like big pets, like big dogs and stuff in the house, stuff like that, is it's going to get dirty quicker. It's going right. to get blocked with the hair and stuff like that. But they generally said just get the cheaper ones and do it three to four times a year. Interesting. Yeah. I even saw a subscription that I thought was pretty interesting. They actually had it where they automatically sent you one every mm-hmm. three months or something like that. I'm like, oh, that's kind of a, that's kind of cool. But obviously they're trying to upsell you the the, the better, best, right. most best. You know. Yeah. They, and I always... I've always heard most people have said don't have to get those ones that have no, that. Just get the cheaper disposable ones is is what I've heard from most people. Right. Because um, it just it seems like it makes the furnace work that much harder to have to go through that membrane that is trying to capture so much more right. than just allowing that airflow to actually go through the system. Yep. So it can make your system. I, I remember I had a lady that uh, in my neighborhood that she was kind of elderly and I would help her with like her water softener. She couldn't lift the bag into her water softener and she'd always have her filters changed. And I couldn't believe some of these things. They were oh, just... Yeah like cotton, like this thick of stuff. Mm-hmm. She had a little Shih Tzu, a little dog, and she just would change those things so often. Really? And I, I didn't want to say anything, you know, because yeah. I'm just trying to help her because she can't get up on a ladder, and I just would always help her. But it was just funny watching these these <laughs> things. And they were fairly dirty coming down, but it was just amazing how thick those darn mm-hmm. filters can be. 
Yeah, and a lot of the the generic ones that go in the ceilings, like we'll see on like new constructions down here, um, are just going to be your one inch, like your twenty by twenty five by one or your twenty by thirty by one. Um, and there's usually two, sometimes three in the house, right? Um, right. Depending on how many units you have, right? Um, but yeah, they're pretty easy to switch out. I just wish people would pay attention. So it's to more important, not necessarily more. to yeah. The, the the filter obviously go cheaper, might as well. Yeah. But just change it more often is yep. going to help that system a lot more. Yeah, obviously. and I just write the date on mine, um, hmm. and I can just sign it up. Like with the flashlight, oh, even and see yeah. it with the sharpie and see when it was last done, and then obviously you can just look at see if it's dirty as well. But, oh, that's a good idea. Just um, write it kind of on the the mm -hmm. frame of the filter. Yep. That's actually kind of a clever that's what idea. I always do because you see some of the commercials now about changing your batteries on your your smoke detectors or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, when you change your calendars, change your batteries. You know, it's kind yep. of a clever way to, yep. to remind people to switch those batteries out. Yeah, so that's how. That's it's funny. I, I have to take a bunch of mine down. All our pets freak out when that thing just Start even beeping. beeps or something like that. And they like, always beep in the middle of the night is when it starts. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. And you can't find the thing, right? No. You're looking around, is it that one? You know, you're a beep and you're like, what? Where? <laughs> why? Why does it keep beeping? Yeah. And, and half the time they seem like they're wired in anyway. It's like, why does it even need a battery? Exactly. But it's like a backup the or backup. something. Yeah. yeah. It's a backup that starts beeping on you. It's like, ah, oh, it's hardwired in. What's going on? Yeah. But it makes sense. If the power goes out, you know, you want to have that thing go off. So, right. Um, is there anything else that, it, so you have a normal home inspection just kind of covers that that fee, and then there's add-ons mm -hmm. for mold or other type of testing. Uh, what do you see as the most common add-on? Is, is it more after your inspection? You say, hey, I recommend you do this. Because I know, I know radon's a little bit more of an issue. It's everywhere. Radon's everywhere. Right. But it seems like up in Salt Lake County and where you're near granite and stuff like that, it's a lot more common in, 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 in um, basements and crawl spaces. Correct. How often are you seeing radon testing in, in southern Utah? Um, so I, like I said, I, I started up by doing the inspections up in Northern Utah and we were doing them on probably one out of every four or one out of every five mm. houses. Um, down here, I'm probably doing them like one out of every 30. Mm. Um, and the ones that I've done, I haven't had any that, cause a lot, most of them that we're doing are slab on grade. Um, and I'll get like a reading. So the EPA is going to recommend having a possible mitigation system put in if it's uh, over four. Okay. Um, and a lot of the average readings I'm getting are anywhere from like 1.5 to 2.5. Um, and obviously it can be higher in different pockets, but I haven't really seen an issue down here, even close to what we were getting up so along it, the Wasatch Front. So is it front. the mold or it's in pest control? Maybe I know termites pest can be a little bit Pest a big one down here. Okay. Um, just getting things sprayed just for, um, obviously you could possibly have termites. You could have like scorpions and, you know, all the other stuff, spiders and stuff that we get. Um, so that's a big one that we'll do. Um, and I'll look for signs of it, but I don't really have the probes and the specific tools that the pest control companies do to do a, a more invasive, uh, like termite inspection, for example. So a lot of times if people have concerns about that, I'll just recommend having them call a, a termite right. company. And you can see the evidence of it, whether there's damage or droppings yeah. or there's a way to see. a lot of see. things you can still see. Right. Yeah. Um, and then like, as far as like a possible meth test, like that's always up to them if they want to. Hmm. Um, we add the fee on just cause there's lab fees associated with that. Um, if people call and like, I'll get some clients that will call, they want it. We really want everything at once. So we just want to do it all at once. And I, and I'm like, okay, well, we can have to do the radon test because it's a two-day test. So I'll try to get that out two days before I even do the inspection so that when the inspection is done, the test is done. Um, we'll do that meth test done. And I'll usually let them know on the mold test, like, let's go through the house first mm. and see. Um, unless you, you are see evidence of water or yes. dripping or staining or something where you can right. check it. Because, okay. again, there's there's pretty heavy lab fees with that. Mm. With that. Um, so um, I always – Try to just tell them, hey, let's go look through it first and then see if there's concerns, unless there's something like on the disclosures or something you know about mm. that has already happened. Then That's really helpful, means, yeah, to get those a... seller disclosures because they can tell you they remodeled, they did this, there's flooding, there was damage, there was something. You can say, okay, double check this room, double right. check this attic, double check this part of it, just make sure the repairs are done correctly. So, right. uh, what's the, and you don't have to do a loan. I mean, obviously, I'd love to have you do a loan, but you don't have to do a loan to do a home inspection. It's not something that's required for any loan. You don't have to turn the home inspection typically into the lender no. unless it's something that the appraiser pops up and we say, hey, we need to get this check. Oh, we already did. Right. It's fixed, it's worked, you know, that type of stuff. So, generally, it's something where it's kind of an ad on as part of your due diligence, mm -hmm. but how do they get hold of you? How would they order an or order a home inspection? How would they order that with you? So, so I have a website. It's just three hundred and sixty inspect Utah. Um, so they can always go to that. Um, I've got my my phone number um, and email address. I believe on this flyer oh, yeah. we, we have got, up we there got as well. Up here on the screen for everybody. Um, so that would always be the easiest way. That's my direct line. So you can call, text, or, or um, just email me. Whatever's best. And then uh, we're typically three to four business days out, and reports are always sent same day. Yeah, that's and even you, you, I see a lot of times they'll say, okay, I'm done with the inspection. If you can be at the house at two o'clock or whatever, mm -hmm. I'll still be there. We can actually walk through and show you the physical thing, yeah. especially if there's a big issue. You can say, oh man, your foundation, your plumbing, 
you got a lot of that butane stuff or whatever that stuff that right. piping has been floating right. around for quite a while that a lot of people have to get switched out. But I really appreciate your expertise. I highly recommend a home inspection. He's your guy if you're looking for a home inspection in southern Utah because I just think they do a really thorough job. Their job is to find something wrong, and there's something wrong. Whether it's a deal killer, like we talked about at the beginning, not very often, but it's enough to where you need at least need to know. So, Colton, yep. really appreciate your friendship and, and helping us with all my clients. And uh, that, that's a wrap for the Clear to Close podcast. So thanks for coming on. Awesome. Thanks. Yep. This has been the Clear to Close podcast. Please submit your comments, questions, and topics for future episodes to cleartoclosepod at gmail.com. That's clear the number two, closepod at gmail.com or ryanbolton.com. Please like, follow, and share. And until next time, this is the Clear to Close podcast. The views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of Patriot Home Mortgage, Equal Housing Lender, NMLS number 299717. This has been a production from a podcast studio.